50 years ago, Boeing's fate was in their hands, but the Incredibles pulled through and launched the 747. If you're trying to do things that hadn't actually been done before on an airplane, the magnificence of which we'd never seen before. Years before that, Magnuson Park played a pivotal role in Boeing's early success. Seattle Traffic, Fireboat Team Seattle. And the Seattle Fire Department turns to the Maritime Academy to train for dangerous water rescues. It makes our ability to provide these services more efficiently and certainly more safely. These stories and more next on City Stream. Hello, I'm Nicole Sanchez. Welcome to City Stream from Magnuson Park. Named after the late Senator Warren Magnuson, this former Naval Air Station covers 350 acres. Its swimming beaches, nature trails, sports fields, and a wide assortment of clubs and organizations make it one of the city's most popular destinations. And this marker at the main entrance to the park holds special significance to the Boeing Company and to aviation history. We'll explain later in the show. If you were a Boeing worker 50 years ago, chances are you spent every waking hour working towards one goal, proving skeptics wrong who said the 747 was too big to fly. These days, Boeing is in the news for troubles with its 737 MAX, but Boeing's woes didn't start there. Each plane has its challenges. And as Jenny Cunningham reports, the 747's growing pains might surprise you. 1969, Pan Am introduces the incredible, the largest, fastest, most comfortable plane in history. So you think you know the 747. Perhaps you flew this giant jet to Europe or Asia. The coach lounge, if you're going where it's going, why fly any other airline? Maybe you had a martini in the groovy bar in the iconic hump. But even if you are the President of the United States and spend nearly as many nights on this 747 as you do at home, you don't know the Queen of the Skies like these folks. There we go. A little more that way. In 1969, they made this happen. February 8, 1969. Jack Waddell, chief test pilot, formally accepts the airplane. At Payne Field at that time, the place was covered with press. Co-pilot Brian Weigel. So I think the three of us we all had one thought on our mind was, uh, don't do anything wrong, don't get, you know. Did you ever think in 1969 you'd be talking about that first flight <laughs> in 2019? I didn't expect to be alive in 2019, but here I am. <laughs> 50 years after test pilot Brian Weigel was one of three crew members who flew a 747 for the first time, a celebration at Seattle's Museum of Flight, starring that plane, the city of Everett, the first one ever built, and starring the Incredibles. If you're trying to do things that hadn't actually been done before on an airplane, the magnificence of which we'd never seen before. The Incredibles were a team of 50,000 engineers, mechanics, and pilots who built... A factory, the world's largest, takes form. So they could create the world's biggest commercial airplane inside that factory. Machining and manufacturing. First designed to roll out, 29 short months. Over the decades, 747 has gained the reputation as an old reliable. But the talk at this party about the birth of the jumbo jet was full of adventure and misadventure. Like this incident with a test plane in Renton. Long plane, short runway, nobody hurt. And there are other stories you may not have heard. All of a sudden, the blast from the engine hit the front end of the station wagon and lifted it up about three feet. And I thought we were going to tip over. We lost all our gyro-operated functions in the cockpit. 
So one by one, my instruments went dead. I did some terrible thing with the arithmetic and basically the wheels locked up on landing and popped all the tires and I knew I would be fired for that. John Hope was just 26 years old when he became chief engineer of the flight simulator for the 747. As the plane took shape, he toggled between the real plane and the simulator. One day he got some figures wrong, remember this is the analog age, and popped the tires on the real plane. When he wasn't fired, he used the incident to improve the simulator. I now had personal experience. When the tires burst, what does it feel like? Everything the Incredibles did was punctuated by urgency. Boeing had borrowed lots of money from lots of banks to develop two trailblazing planes, the 747 and the Boeing SST. With a mighty roar, Concorde 001 swooped low over the city, heading for Le Bourget and the Paris Air Show. Concorde won the supersonic battle. Boeing's SST project folded, and all hopes were on the 747. T. Wilson came into the cockpit, who was our president at the time, looked at the three of us and said, Gentlemen, I just want you to know that the future of the company is in your hands. primarily responsible for the design of this entire panel. Pat to Roberts was the engineer on the 747's first flight across an ocean. His crew was ordered to fly to the Paris Air Show, even though the range of the plane was untested. And the engines? Soon after liftoff, all four engines went into overheat. The crew decided to head toward Paris to see if the engines would cool down once they built up some speed. So, <laughs> It was interesting. <laughs> and it worked. 747 was a hit at the air show, but those Pratt & Whitney engines continued to plague the program. During the flight testing, we changed 55 engines within one year. What does that mean, changed uh, Remove and replace, engine malfunctions. The Incredibles didn't give up. They got to the bottom of the engine problem and invented a fix. And that kicked off the wondrous days of affordable, spacious, delicious travel. Japan Airlines has captured the spirit of the Japanese garden aboard its new spacious 747 garden jet. Too, we have the caviar card. Caviar and pate. I remember one time having to do eggs to order for 36 people in first class. Everybody that works on it, it just falls in love with it. So I would like to honor everybody that's worked on it, and I would suggest a toast, but I don't have any beer or wine here. <laughs> As the 747 pioneers wrap up this flight down memory lane, there's a bittersweet realization. This may be one of the last gatherings of the Incredibles. In part, I am here for the people that can't be here. But all of my bosses that I work for are now deceased. And so I'm kind of here for them. But their legacy will endure because of a plane that carried space shuttles and presidents. And most importantly, it flew millions of us to the world. We made an airplane that actually changed world commerce history. And that, that was pretty emotional. Next time you visit the Museum of Flight, spend some time with this first 747, and maybe, just maybe, you'll hear the voices of the Incredibles. I guess this sounds complacent or something, but that thing is just ridiculously easy to fly. It's just a pilot's dream. I enjoyed the excitement, which is a part of my heart to this very day. And an echo of that maiden flight half a century ago. Over the next year, the Museum of Flight will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 747's maiden flight. And you can learn more by going to their website, museumofflight.org.
we're not done talking Boeing just yet. Later, we'll explore the company's connection to Magnuson Park. Also, Seattle firefighters use a simulator to prepare for dangerous duty at sea. All this as CityStream continues. We return from the dramatic Finn Art Project at Magnuson Park. Artist John T. Young intended for this to portray a pod of killer whales, their fins peeking above the waterline. But a closer look reveals these metal monoliths are actually wings from decommissioned submarines. It's not unusual to find orcas and even submarines navigating through our local waters. But those same waters can be dangerous to navigate during an emergency situation. But Seattle firefighters are better prepared thanks to some high-tech help from the Maritime Academy. Ian DeVere takes a look. My name is Greg Anderson. I'm a fireboat pilot with the Seattle Fire Department. Basically, the pilot's job is the, uh, the safety of the vessel and the crew as we're responding to emergency. Go clear, Greg! Pretty much anything that happens within a block of the water, uh, we'll go to. Seattle's not only a port city, but it's a water city. There are about 200 miles of shoreline, and we're, we're the resource that, uh, that protects that. The, the kind of calls we run on are uh, vessels in distress, ship fires, fires along the water, up to Duwamish, we've had several large fires, and uh, rescues along the waterfront. So we uh, have regularly scheduled drills where we'll, we'll operate the cannons, we'll take uh, lines underneath piers with uh, small pumps, as well as a number of uh, man overboard and, and underway drills. It was a particularly windy day, and there were, there were lots of challenges around Seattle that day. Seattle Traffic, Fireboat Chief Seattle. We heard on the Marine VHF that there was a problem up north. Boats adrift, uh, in distress up uh, by the Edmonds Kingston Ferry Lane. Okay, Roger, we'll stay right on the, uh, the east side of the lanes heading up there, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cross at, uh, at Foxtrot. And, uh, and make our way over. One of our training challenges is that we don't get to, we don't get to pick the traffic that we want people to learn how to navigate around. And this is where our partnership with Seattle Maritime Academy comes into play. Yeah, station calling. Go ahead, this is Ocean Mover. Yeah, Ocean Mover, this is Fire Valesha. We're responding to a fire over the Eagle Harbor. The project that the Seattle Fire Department and the Seattle Maritime Academy are doing is, is pretty unique. Fireboat Lesha, I have Bainbridge Fire. Lesha, go ahead. We're able to provide experience for some of these pilots in a matter of days that they may not get over a career. Yeah, Lesha, we've uh, arrived on scene here. We're setting up uh, for this ferry fire. It looks like the fire is on the uh, outer eastern of this ferry boat, and uh, we're going to start our firefighting procedures. What's your ETA over? Our ETA is approximately 30 minutes. The simulation is a fireboat pilot and a deckhand slash watch stander. They have to go through the checking in with the Seattle traffic and navigating across the traffic lanes or navigating through Elliott Bay to get to the, the fire area. Elliott Bay, according to the Coast Guard, is the most congested waterway in the state. So the challenges of just getting out into Elliott Bay are, are sometimes significant. And they get to practice this in different kinds of conditions that they might not get to otherwise. This is the ferry Afternoon, Cap. This is the fireboat Chief Seattle. We're uh, responding up here. We had a report of a vessel adrift, and I was uh, Wondering if you saw him uh, and could give us a little better direction. The information we get for the location of the emergency is sometimes vague. Sometimes it's latitude and longitude. Sometimes I just saw him off the ferry. We think we see him or something. to the north of us. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll head up that direction. Thanks much for the help, Fireboat Chief Seattle. We, uh, we occasionally run into situations that we would like to share with all the pilots and see what kind of decision-making uh, processes they go through. 
and we will incorporate those into the simulations. Stand by side, this is the Coast Guard 6525. Uh, we've also got a report of uh, a person in the water. Have you heard that over? Fargo and uh, we have a visual on that person in the water. If you need any assistance, let us know. There he is right there. Bearing 286. Oh yeah, you can see it. Yeah, he's waving his arms. We're developing new scenarios all the time. And this enables Seattle Fire Department to come in here several times over the next two years and as I mentioned progressively get uh, more and more challenging scenarios and it makes our ability to provide these services more efficiently and certainly more safely and and the challenges are are pretty close to real world yep, got them. that boom yeah the booms come off the mast yeah, that got just a little windier than he'd planned for. One of the best ways I've heard to describe the utility of the fireboats is that while you may not need them very often, when you do need them, there's nothing that'll replace them. The Seattle Fire Department training is well-timed since boating season is going on right now. If you'd like to learn more about how to stay safe on the water, just go to seattle.gov and search marina and boating safety. Speaking of boating, Magnuson Park has some wonderful programs where folks can learn how to sail and paddle. And we're joined by Seth Muir, the executive director of Sail Sandpoint. What an amazing location and sounds like you have some great programs. Tell us what you have here. Yeah, so Sail Sandpoint has been around just over 20 years, and our mission is to bring the joy and life-enhancing benefits of sailing and small boats to people of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities. We do that through a whole suite of programs, from rentals to camps to lessons and everything in between. And I understand a lot of people take advantage and get to participate in your programs. Was it 15,000 you served last year? Absolutely. Between the visitors here to the waterfront, utilizing all of our facilities, to the folks who store and rent boats here, 15,000 guests came through last year. I noticed you rent out sailboats for all levels, from Hobies to Flying Juniors. Did I get the terms right? Yes, you did. Tell us about the wide range you offer to, to rent here. Yeah, so we want this place to be accessible to everybody, um, regardless of their background and experience. So we even start um, with vessels that aren't sail-powered. Um, we rent paddle boards and kayaks that are incredibly stable and easy to get on the water with, all the way up to more complicated uh, boats like our um, RS Quest, um, and then the lessons that we offer on um, small keel boats and um, yeah, a whole wide range of things. Um, the Flying Junior and the Hobie are just a couple of them. So much fun, and I know you've got camps, the rentals, lots of activities. You can find out more by going to sailsandpoint.org. Thank you so much, Seth. Thanks for, uh, for speaking to me today. And we'll be right back. Summer is here, water activities are on the minds of a lot of folks, and we are joined by the Seattle Parks Acting Aquatic Manager, Mike Plimpton, to talk about all the fun water activities here at Magnuson Park. Tell us. So we have a wading pool program that's staffed seven days a week from 12.15 to 6.30 p.m. that opened on June 22nd, and it's gonna run all the way through August 25th this year. And Mike, I know also the swimming beach area is so popular, and I'm glad as a parent to see you have lifeguards here. Tell us about their schedule and where they're at. So we have lifeguards at Magnuson Beach and eight other, other locations in Seattle Parks. We have seven on Lake Washington and two on Green Lake. At Magnuson, where we're at, they close on August the 25th. Uh, those locations are staffed from 11 to 7 on weekends and noon to 7 on weekdays. And one of the great things about the swim lessons is I understand they're either free or you have scholarships available if needed. Correct. So all of our beaches offer a free swimming lesson program for youth age 6 to 17. And then, and that is, uh, we have a daytime program that's Monday through Friday, 12.15 to 12.45 at all nine of our locations, and Monday and Thursday evenings from 6 to 6.30 p.m. to better connect with working parents. A lot of summer fun that's going to be happening here at Magnuson Park. Mike with uh, Acting Aquatics Director with Seattle Parks. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you very much.
Ahead on CityStream, Magnuson Park's aviation past reveals some historic achievements and the earliest days of the Boeing Company. Magnuson Park is beloved for its beaches, ballparks, and this very popular and friendly off-leash dog area. There's also many organizations and clubs that are housed here. Some people know this area used to house a busy naval air station, but you might not realize what a role this area played in the early years of Boeing. Felix Bennell explains. It's fairly well known that Seattle's Magnuson Park was once the site of a naval air station. The old hangars and remnants of concrete runways were silent witness to the military activities here from the 1920s to the 1970s. And now many have been converted to recreational uses. What's not as well known is how much the Boeing Company's early history and Sandpoint history are linked together almost from the time a plane first landed there in 1920. The Sandpoint connection is a very interesting one. I wish, frankly, as a historian, that we knew more about it than we do. Dan Hagedorn knows more about aviation history than just about anyone around here. He says that not many people know that in the 1920s, Sandpoint was a key part of Boeing's rapid growth as an aviation leader. Boeing did very actively make use of that airport simply because there were very few hard surface, long runway areas capable of taking the airplanes of the day. Boeing historian Mike Lombardi says that, believe it or not, Sandpoint was where Boeing actually assembled some of its earliest aircraft. This was the site where Boeing delivered all of its first airplanes early on. So, so a lot of the early fighter planes that Boeing built for the Army and the Navy flew from Sandpoint and then one of the great moments for Boeing history is that the very first commercial airplanes, the production airplanes that Boeing built, the Model 40s, mail planes, the, um, the assemblies were, were sent by truck from the Boeing plant on the Duwamish plant one, were sent by truck to, the, uh, to Sandpoint where the planes were actually assembled, right there out in the field. The Boeing mechanics who put together the company's own planes at Sandpoint also played a critical role in the famous, but mostly forgotten, around the world flight that began on the shores of Lake Washington almost a hundred years ago. One of the great events in aviation history was, began there at Sandpoint. In 1924, the um, United States Army had this goal to fly, be the first to fly around the world. And uh, Douglas Aircraft built, built the airplanes, the Douglas World Cruisers, to do that flight. And those planes were flown up to Sandpoint, and Boeing modified the airplanes, put uh, floats on them so they could fly off of Lake Washington and then continue their route to uh, across the Pacific with floats. There was a monument created for that for that event, big, a big statue of an eagle, and was uh, always prominent. Today, um, you'll, if you blink, you miss it. Right there as you go into, into Sandpoint, as you go through the entrance there, you'll see this statue with an eagle on it, and that's the memorial to the flight. That monument was dedicated in 1924, but Boeing's connection to Sandpoint lasted well into the late 1930s the age of the legendary Boeing Clipper. The 42-ton Pan American flying boat Yankee Clipper makes aerial history. The Boeing Clipper was probably one of the most romantic of all of Boeing's planes. It was a huge flying boat 
It was elegant in terms of its service. It even had silverware. Uh, one of the most romantic of Boeing's planes, but one that seems so distant from us today. While not technically part of Sand Point, it was just north of there that Boeing tested those famous clippers. Around uh, April of 1938, Boeing leased some property at Matthews Beach with the idea that that would be used to do all of the testing of the new clippers. So rather than testing them on Puget Sound or Elliott Bay, that's where the planes were tested. So Boeing set up a facility there at Matthews Beach, put in a dock and, uh, and a shed where the employees would, uh, the night watchmen would stay to protect the planes and the, and the employees would work and the pilots would fly out of there. So it's a, it's a little known piece of history, but for, quite, for about almost a year there, the Clippers were flying pretty, pretty regular flights uh, almost every day, uh, doing some taxi tests or doing flight tests from Matthews Beach. So that would have been quite the thing to see. With all the Boeing history and so much more at Magnuson Park and Matthews Beach these days, it's a special part of Seattle that's still quite the thing to see. The history of Magnuson Park is truly fascinating, and we're joined now by Lynn Ferguson, who knows the history well. She is the president of the Friends of Sandpoint Magnuson Park Historic District. It's so nice to meet you, Lynn. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. And I think a lot of people know this is a former naval air station. I remember as a child growing up going to the commissary with my mom being a military family. But the Boeing connection, as Felix just told us in that story, I think that's surprising to a lot of people. Why didn't Boeing stay here at Sandpoint? Well, they didn't stay here because the Navy took it over and Boeing moved to Boeing Field in 1927. That was always planned. It was going to be a naval air station in the Northwest. And, um, you know, the Northwest is all of the Northwest plus Hawaii and Alaska, and that was very important. What a rich history here. And I understand there was a very special visitor in 1927. Charles Lindbergh came here. Share with us some about that fun visit. He did. He was one of the 15 uh, sites on his tour after he'd crossed the Atlantic. And there was a ticker tape parade here for the first time in Seattle. We and I interviewed a neighbor, uh, Burr O'Dell, who actually got let out at Broadway High School to go and hear him talk in 1927 up in Volunteer Park and in a big old open car. And um, they, they flew over Seattle and dropped leaflets about airmail because Boeing wanted to have airmail too and was publicizing that. So. Wow, and then later when the Navy took over, I understand this was an important air station used to train naval aviators. So very important for the military, right? It was. Uh, UW, um, the NROTC trained down here, as did a lot of reserve pilots for years. And of course, in World War II and the Korean War, it was extremely important as head of the 13th Naval District and that would include all the Northwest plus Hawaii and Alaska. And we're just steps from the water. I understand sometimes those planes had to make an emergency landing into the lake. Are there remains? Still? I hear from an expert there are 109 planes somewhere in Lake Washington. Some of them are right outside here. You can go to our website and we have some of them spotted. But if you're a diver, they're a great diving site. How exciting. Thank you so much, Lynn, for your time. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll be right back. Well, that's going to wrap up this episode of City Stream. If you'd like to learn more about any of the events and camps happening here at Magnuson Park, just go to seattle.gov and search Magnuson Park. I'm Nicole Sanchez. Thanks so much for watching.